but I'd like to now introduce the next speaker. It's Brian Kolb from the University of Lethbridge. Brian's research focuses on how neurons in the cerebral cortex change in response to experiences, drugs, hormones, and injury, and how these changes influence behavior. Over 40 years, he has identified the rules that govern the effects of cerebral injury on different developmental ages. His work has fueled new treatments to help victims of cerebral injury. Kolb was first to demonstrate how new brain cells grow to restore cerebral function, both in development and ad adulthood, and the first to show with Terry Robinson that psychoactive drugs produce permanent changes in neuronal structures, in cerebral structures, and that these change, changes influence later brain plasticity. So thank you, Brian. Thank you everybody for coming. Um, as a native Calgarian, uh, I can tell you that when I moved to Lethbridge from Montreal in 1976, I had never been there. So I bet none of you have either. Normally when I go across the country, I have to point out that Lethbridge is not the city between Calgary and Edmonton, but you know that, I hope. Um, has a uh, record, I guess, of being a little windier than Calgary, but it ain't true. Okay. <laughs> If we can see the next slide, please. Can I, I can change them. Yeah. Okay, my take home message is there. You can read it just as well as I can. One of the points I want to make that Tom did not make was that it's not just the events that occur after birth that are important. It's events that occur before birth and before conception. And I'll show you that, that are important in determining uh, who you are and who your brain uh, is. And I think that since my mother is dead, I can blame her for everything <laughs> that's happened and things that happened to her before she met my dad. Okay, a lot of people are puzzled and they say, why can you use rats to learn anything about children? And so I thought I'd just say a little bit about how we can do this. So rats are very clever. Albertans don't know about rats because they're not legal here. Um, but they uh, are wonderful animals. Uh, they can be trained to do all sorts of things, and so we can do a lot of behavioral tests, and you can see a rat here uh, learning to reach through that slot to get food, just an, uh, uh, an easy example to give. We can also infer the mechanisms for the effects that Tom talked about and I'm going to talk about from what's known as epigenetics. That was one of the slides he didn't show you, but the idea is that you are not just your DNA. It's not all on. So you have toenails and hair and skin and brain, and they all have the same DNA, but the cells don't look the same. And that's because different genes are turned on or off. And the idea is that experiences can affect that. Finally, we can see that gorgeous thing on the right. Um, that's a neuron, and as Tom mentioned, you've got 86 billion of those, give or take a few. And we can actually um, look at the structure of the neuron, and he gave you a, a sort of a qualitative uh, view of, of a stressed neuron. We can actually see how it changes, and we can use that to infer changes in the organization of the brain. Now, you can see here that the brain starts developing rather early. At 25 days, there's something of gestation. There's something that's going to be a brain. It's not really a brain. But there's this long period of time here that the brain is being affected by what's going on in the mom and around the mom. But when the child is born, that brain doesn't look like your brain. So there's a lot of things that are going to go on, especially in that first 1,000 days, as Tom mentioned. Now, Tom mentioned the prefrontal cortex. I'm a prefrontal chauvinist by which I mean I think it's the most important part of the brain. And you can, s and for many things it is, you can see here that, whoops, this is an increase in the number of synapses in the, in the uh, prefrontal cortex. It reaches a peak around age five, and then it starts to drop. And it drops very quickly during adolescence, peri-adolescence. And so those of you who've had teenage girls know what I'm talking about, <laughs> that they're losing about 100,000 synapses a second. So 100,000 gone, 100,000 gone. And so after the day that you put up with them, you, I remember saying to my wife, why did we do this? <laughs> and the next day, I uh, saying, oh, it's a different person. All night she was changing her brain, but of course we went through this again. So there's this <laughs> period here that's really important. And a second, this is the first 1,000 days and a little more, and this second period in, during adolescence, but notice, it, it continues to uh, prune until at least the third, the end of the third decade. So it's a very protracted period. Now, what I've been studying for the last 40 or 50 years 
is the various, effect, various events that can affect brain development. Obviously, in 10 minutes, I can't tell you very much about them, but I'm going to tell you something about good, bad, and ugly experiences. Good, perhaps the, the goodest, if you like, or the best uh, that we've seen is tactile stimulation. So if you look here, <coughs> you can see uh, maternal massage. You can see what's called kangaroo care for obvious reasons. So you can see the skin-to-skin -skin contact. This is a, um, a rat, mother rat being brushed with a child's hairbrush. I know it looks a little gruesome. That was the artist who drew it sort of spiky. But you can brush the, the um, rat. There's a child getting, or baby getting massaged. And there's a little baby rat with a little paintbrush. Now, why is this important? Well, it turns out that you can get to the brain through the skin. So if we look here at the effect of tactile stimulation, so what we did in this experiment was to, to do this tactically stimulate baby rats. So you line them up like little Vienna sausages, and then you just go up and down with your little paintbrush. We use a Swifter now because you can do them all at once. <laughs> it's pretty fast. You can do that 15 minutes twice a day for two weeks, leave them alone for the next four months, and then look at all sorts of cognitive and motor skills. And this just does the motor skill because it's easy. This is the accuracy of reaching through to grab food. They're very good with their digits. And you can see the animals that had tactile stimulation are way better than the animals who did not have it. So that's the only intervention we did. So how can this happen? How can you have that? Well, it's because the brain has been altered by this uh, tactile stimulation. The circuits have changed. We can see effects uh, on cognitive behaviors as well as um, motor behaviors and social behaviors. How does this happen? Well, it's true of, of humans as well. There's a study showing that, that women who um, have po uh, postpartum depression, the more that they tactically stimulate their babies, the better off the babies are. Now, how does this happen? It turns out that when you fall and you scrape your hand, what do you do? You rub it. When you rub it, what happens? It feels better. Why does it feel better? Because the skin is making stuff that actually repairs it. That stuff it's making, if you remember back to biology 30 or 20, um, all those years ago, the brain and, and um, skin are from the same germ cell layer. They respond to the same thing. So the stuff you're making in your skin goes through the blood-brain barrier and affects the brain. It turns out to be a good thing. That One of the things that uh, the skin produces is called FGF2, which the brain has receptors for. So you can actually get to the brain through the skin. So the tactile stimulation is a marvelous way of getting through. Now, one of the things that's unfortunate about the schools now is you can't touch the kids when they're stressed. But I'm going to suggest to you that one of the most important things you would have to do is to touch, you guys are nodding, touch, touch the kids. OK, how about bad? Tom alluded to bad. Examples here are preconceptual stress, gestational stress. I'll give you a quick example of both. How would you stress a rat? Well, there's a variety of ways. You can put them in some sort of confined space. They don't like that very much. Neither do I. Um, or you can uh, expose them to the odor of predators. You can put them on a little platform. You can take their babies away and so on. All sorts of ways you can stress them, and you can measure how that happens. And if you do that, if we take dads and we stress them before they're mated with mums, so we stress them for, for uh, 40 days, and then when they're mated with the mums, and we look at their babies four months after they're born, which in rat's world is their adults, what you can see is that there are fewer connections in the offspring brain. There are actually fewer neurons. Um, we have decreased gene expression in the offspring's brain, so we have that epigenetic effect. And we have reduced motor and cognitive abilities. How bad is this? It's equivalent to having had a perinatal brain injury. So if we look here, I'm using, again, the same behavior just to make it easy. This is the accuracy. This is the control animal as accuracy. And this is the animal, the only experience it had that's different is its dad was stressed before it was conceived. We see similar effects on cognitive behaviors and social behaviors. So that preconceptual stress is sufficient to change the way the brain um, develops. Didn't work. Uh, gestational stress does more or less the same thing. Tom showed you the example of those neurons. Um, so we have a smaller brain in adulthood. Uh, so what happens is the mum is stressed during the mid, the, basically the second trimester, um, and partway through the third, and then it stopped. Uh, we see change in gene expression. We see abnormal play behavior. We see anxious animals, cognitive impairments. And again, you can see this simple uh, bit of the dendrite in the stressed brain versus the um, normal brain. Now, 
If we look at natural disasters in, in Canada, up until recently, you know what the biggest national, natural disaster ever was, and we just had it. But up to that time was the Quebec ice storm in 1998. A lot of people were without power for up to six weeks or two, or two months. Um, you, you've seen in the pictures, you remember what happened. But it's an interesting way to study the effects of stress, because a lot of women hadn't been, become pregnant yet. That's preconceptual stress. Or they were pregnant, or they'd had their children. So you've got preconceptual, gestational, perinatal stress, or none at all. And um, what you can do then is you can study the, the kids. And so I just said that children are being followed with behavior, with brain scans, and with epigenetics. And if you look at the data, it turns out these kids were measured at 2, 5.5, 8.5, and 11.5 years of age. They're now 13, more or less, uh, years of age. In, in terms of the analysis, uh, we have a drop in IQ of about 10 points. That's not insignificant. In the kids who had the gestational stress, uh, they have uh, retarded language development. They have retarded motor skills. They have abnormalities in, in social interactions and play behavior. And in addition, we see epigenetic effects. Now, this is going to seem like a weird graph. It's not. It's really easy to understand. What you have up here is a scale of really stressed to not stressed. And what the authors did was to say, OK, there's a line about here. Uh, this, these are stressed and these aren't. And the color of the um, bars here reflects whether genes are turned on or off. The only point you want to get from this is that the ones that are on this side, the color is different. These are all different genes. The color is different than on this side. These are from their kids when they're 13 years old. So 13 years after their mom was stressed and they were in utero, we can see difference in their blood uh, in the expression of genes, in hundreds of, hundreds of genes. Tom Boyce was going to expand on ugly, but didn't. So I'll just, I was going to be speaking before him. The big point here about poverty is that poverty is the worst experience kids can have. And one of the things, he had a slide that we didn't see, but basically, if you look at uh, the development of the language regions in the brain, they're retarded in children who come from families whose uh, mean income is less than $50,000, total income. That's actually not as low as you might think in terms of poverty, but that, those are the, the results from the US. That's correlated with poor language skill development and other cognitive problems as well. OK. To finish off, can we reverse bad things? The answer is yes. We can reverse bad things. There's a variety of ways to do this. I'm going to pick on tactile stimulation, but point out there's other ways. One is diet, and Tom alluded to diet. Another one is to mess with uh, neurotrophic factors such as FGF2, which is the one I said is in the skin. So if we simply use tactile stimulation or environmental stimulation, can we reverse the effects, for example, of gestational stress? And the answer is, yeah. So if we look at tactile st stimulation, I've already told you what that is. So you've got gestational stress, then we're going to tactilely stimulate the babies afterwards to try and reverse those effects. Or we can put animals in complex environments. Now, I want you to see those environments as being the opposite of poverty. There's lots of things in there. They have toys as a, a value judgment here, but there are toys they can play with. There are uh, lots of conspecifics they can play with. There's lots of activity. There's lots of extra uh, foodstuffs and so on. And that reverses the effects of those early experiences. So we can do it. So to conclude, it's more or less what Tom concluded with. We're kind of boring since we do the same things. Uh, but brain development is influenced by a lot of positive and negative experiences. It's not all negative. A lot of positive things. And I told you about one example of positive was tactile stimulation. Another one is parent-infant interaction. Another one is peer interactions. The negative ones are more obvious, stress, drugs, um, and so on. Um, these experiences alter brain and behavioral development through changes in gene expression, among other things. But that's the major mechanism that we um, allude to. And it's possible to intervene, but you have to do it early. You want to do it as soon as you can. And you certainly want to do it before adolescence, because during that adolescent period, when the brain is really changing again, it's really vulnerable. What's the one thing you don't want those kids doing during that uh, adolescent period when the brain is changing? Marijuana, alcohol, 
nicotine because it's having an effect on the brain that's not like the effect on our brains. It's a different effect. It has a high incidence of psychotic uh, sequela later on. So there's those two periods in particular that you want to intervene. And you saw the Tom, Tom slide from, from Hackett showing the um, decrease in effectiveness, cost effectiveness, the later you go. And I have, I'm in my last minute and I'm done. Thank you. So again, the same routine. We have mics for people who would like to ask questions, and we'll take those to you. And Amy, I, we can also take um, one that's online. We'll go to Suzanne first. Hello, Hi. Suzanne. Hello, Brian. <laughs> that was fantastic, as usual. Thank you very much. I'm just wondering, is, is touch and holding the same as tactile stimulation? Yes. It's, uh, holding, or as good as? Uh, yeah. Um, contact, let's call it that. Holding, not shaking, right? Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, in fact, they don't even have to touch the child. You can use a broad spectrum light on bare skin. And that, well, I don't know if it's true of humans, it's true of rats. And, and that's effective too. You've just got to do enough to turn on that, those systems. But yes, you don't have to necessarily stroke it. Although in our hands, we believe stroking is more effective because you're affecting more skin than if you're just holding. But in the um, kangaroo care and in South America where they hold the kids, the kids are just in a constant um, harness. Yeah. And so I guess that would be if you're saying stroking works, then stroking would be the same as having a hand. Like, is it something about a physical touch in babies or humans, or is the paintbrush good enough? A we just paint brush. all the kids in kindergarten. We could paint all the kids in kindergarten. Okay. I think it would be effect, as long as it's on skin, not on clothing. Yeah. Ah, thank you. Other questions in the room? Hi, I'm not sure if this is uh, particularly, well, it's somewhat relevant, but I'm interested in when you were introduced about the psychoactive drugs having a permanent effect on the brain and if you might be able to speak to that sure. for a few moments. Sure. So psychoactive drugs are drugs that affect behavior and they do that by changing the brain. Every psychoactive drug you're exposed to leaves a footprint in the brain. One exposure to nicotine, um, the footprint goes away, but uh, in our studies, giving RAS the equivalent of the amount of nicotine that you would get from one cigarette a day for 14 days, four months later we can see the change in the brain. So every psychoactive drug is having that footprint. If you are exposed to these drugs in utero, the footprint is different than it is if you're exposed to those drugs when you're 30 years old. But nonetheless, there is a footprint. There is also a footprint if the drug is given preconceptually uh, to dads, we haven't done moms to this point. I have no doubt that it's going to be true. So what, the, what's the footprint? The structure of, of, of neural circuits is altered. And is this good or bad? Well, it, it's a thing. Um, it isn't necessarily good or bad. It's just a thing that happens. Um, I don't know if, it, if, you, if that answers your question sufficiently. Oh, okay. Sorry. So if you're giving drugs for um, things like ADHD, so you're giving methylphenidate for ADHD, does that affect the brain? Yeah, it does, but that's the whole point, is that you want to change the brain. So in that case, it's a good thing. Um, methylphenidate's a little unusual in that the effects aren't as persistent as, say, nicotine, and that's why you have to keep taking it. You'd think, well, you wouldn't have to keep taking it, but there's two effects. One is the change in the brain, and the other is the uh, enhanced brain activity, particularly in prefrontal cortex, leading to enhanced attention. So we do have time, Amy, if you have online nothing from the chat room. Yeah, if you could take a mic to Amy. Uh, sorry, uh, we'll just take one online to make sure we engage those folks. Uh, Melanie Lukovich is asking, where would children with autism fit in this situation? Do they have too many synaptic connections which make them hypersensitive to touch? That's one of the hypotheses, yeah, that they, that they do have enhanced neural activity leading to this extreme reaction to touch. And we do have uh, one uh, former student who's in Cardston who works for Alberta Mental Health who's actually um, taking babies at risk for autism, i.e. they have a sibling or a cousin with autism and tactilely stimulating them from birth to see if it can reduce the incidence or not. We don't know yet what that outcome is going to be. 
We can take one more question in the room. I think there was. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. I was just interested to find out, did you notice or identify a difference between paternal versus maternal stress in preconceptual um, stress, I suppose? The, the effects on the mom and the dad are surprisingly similar in terms of stress as well as other positive things. So we were surprised that it was so similar, but it is. Okay. Thank you, everyone. And please hold any questions that those of you in the room who had hands almost raised. Um, and online, I'm sure we'll have more coming in. So we'll have time at the end of all four to ask more questions.